Hey guys, so today I wanted to share with you a little bit about third year, fourth year, and also my CQ rotation currently at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. So right now I'm on a CQ rotation, that stands for Surgical Intensive Care Unit. And basically you're treating the sickest of the sick patients here. Uh, it's my first time at Beth Israel actually. I've My third year of medical school, this is when you spend a lot of your time in the hospital. And I actually spent that at Mass General. And then I did my fourth year sub-internships at Brigham, my medicine sub-I, and also my surgery sub-I at the Brigham. And then I went, did a year of research and then went back to do two more sub-internships, one in burn surgery and one thoracic surgery at Mass General. So it's been a, a very good time at Beth Israel to, to experience the, the other hospital, the other teaching, the main flagship teaching hospital for Harvard. And... But just to go over a little bit of terminology, so you heard, you heard me say sub-I and sub-internship. For those of you who are not familiar, basically as a sub-intern, you're functioning as half of an intern or a third of an intern. But the, the definition of a sub-intern actually changes from place to place. And so you might be wondering, well, what, what's an intern? So an intern in the United States, because I know this changes from country to country, an intern is actually, um, in the United States, it's the first year resident. So in the United States, medical school is four years, usually sometimes five, um, sometimes eight if you're doing MD-PhD. And then you do residency. So in medical school, you learn about medical care. And then you get your, after you graduate, you have your medical degree. And then now in residency, you're learning how to be very proficient clinically to treat your patients. You have legal responsibilities. You're actually prescribing medications and orders now. So a first year resident is an intern. And then the medical school, they try to transition you from third year where you're learning how to be in the hospital, to learning the vocabulary to actually in, to take care uh, to taking care of patients in the fourth year. So, but the definition changes from place to place. So when I did my fourth year sub-internship at the Brigham in medicine, I was following three or four patients. I was writing the admin orders, the medications, labs, tests, but everything was co-signed with the senior resident. So the senior resident was, for me, it was the third year internal medicine resident, somebody who had done internal, medicines, uh, internal medicine residency for three years. And she was very experienced, great teacher, and basically, so I would write all these orders, but she would actually co-sign them, and then, because as a med student, you don't actually technically write orders, but it was good practice for me. And then, so in the, morning before rounds. So during rounds, you, the entire team of the attending and the residents and you, you go patient to patient, you check up on them, you see how they're doing, and then you figure out the plan for the rest of the day. And then, but for me, uh, as a sub-intern, I went there before rounds to check in on my patients and to start formulating a plan by myself that I would then present to the attending, present to the residents, and then they would help me fix and figure out what parts I missed and how, how to get it how to construct a good plan for my patient of that day. So the that was that's that's a very, very brief overview. I'm sure I'm missing holes, but it's kind of that's a general overview of the, the medicine sub internship at the Brigham. And but I did I then did my general surgery sub internship at the Brigham. And and I thought it would be really similar to the medicine sub I, but it's actually very different. So for that sub internship I went in before rounds also to check in on a patient and figure out a plan and then I presented the plan, presented the overnight events for the entire team when the entire team was rounding. But then the rest of the day I was actually in the operating room with the chief resident and with the attending. So the chief resident, that definition also varies but for us that, that is the seventh year surgical resident. So somebody who's had a lot of experience in almost about to be attending. And so it was him or her and the attending physician, the attending surgeon who is in charge of everything and responsible for everything, and then me, the sub -intern. And so I was not on the floor. So as a medicine sub -intern, you're always on the floor, you're taking pages, you're talking to consults. As a surgery sub -intern, I was mostly in the operating room. And then, but even from hospital to hospital, that changes. So when I was at Mass General doing my thoracic surgery rotation, I didn't, I didn't actually present the plan because uh, the chief resident, he wanted to present the plan for the patient. So 
this this whole concept of plan, I've been mentioning that, and that might sound a little bit unfamiliar, but just to give you an example, so, so right now I'm at the surgical intensive care unit. These patients are critically ill, and so when you figure out how to take care of them, there's actually, there's a structure, and you go what's called a plan by system. So you go through everything you can think of that you need to worry about, you need to be concerned about for their neurological system, and then, which is the brain. So often these patients, they need pain management, they need to be on sedation, because they have, uh, for a variety of reasons, but one of them is because they, they might have a tube down their throat and a mechanical machine helping them breathe. And then you have a cardiovascular plan for the heart. They might need to be on blood pressure control, on pressors. You might need to give them uh, echo, and you might need to do echo and see how their heart function is. And then pulmonary, which is their lung function, and GI, which is their intestinal function, and renal, which is their kidney function. And then you have to worry about infectious disease problems, um, just any kind of bacterial infections. And then you also think about what to do prophylactically, so how to prevent them from getting blood clots and how to prevent them from getting ulcers in their stomach. And I'm sure I'm missing something because it's just my first week, but this is, again, a very brief overview of what that's like. So I think what, what really drove me to make this video today, though, is that in the SICU you see the patients who are really sick. And so something that I've learned in medical school. So often you hear about how patients die. And you, you learn about people, you, you learn the textbook answer. But, and then when I was in the emergency department, I actually was doing emergency chest compressions on patients who were dying in front of me. And, 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 I, and I saw people die and, and it was very sad and very tragic. And, but, you don't actually, I think for a lot of chronic diseases, so in the emergency room I saw a lot of people die from trauma, and so that was, so the cause of death was clear to me. It was because they had massive blood loss, for example, and then their heart just stopped beating. Um, but it's more unclear to me and my classmates, my classmates and I, we've been talking about this, is that when you hear about blood pressure control, for example, you hear that it's really important that somebody doesn't have high blood pressure, but you don't actually see the progression. You don't see patients dying from having high blood pressure in the hospital, usually. I, I haven't seen that. It may be very different for you, but but in the intensive care unit, this you, you see the patients dying from those chronic illnesses and also from trauma and also from surgery. But so th this is all just to say that it's quite serious. It, it's a serious uh, environment and it has gotten me thinking about how important it is for us to take care of ourselves before we get in uh, a state where we have chronic illness and we're really sick. So. I'm about to make a random jump, but basically the, the jump I'm trying to make is that I was in the ICU, I saw a lot of very sick patients dying, and then I thought that I thought about how important it is for us to take care of ourselves and, and the preventive things that we can do. So I'm saying this because, so that there are some simple things that we can do to take care of ourselves that I don't think a lot of people are doing. Because uh, I, I know not a lot of people drink. So the sim one of the simplest things is to floss teeth daily. So this is something, so one of the fun things about going to Harvard Medical School is that you're also with the Harvard Dental School students for the first two years. You take classes, you take your biochemistry, you take pathophysiology, you take all these classes with the dental school students. And then I'm in the medical school dorm, so I'm also living with med students, dental students. So one of the fun things is that when you're in the bathroom, you're brushing your teeth, at night. Um, the med students usually don't floss their teeth, but the dental students, it doesn't matter how, um, it, it just every single dental student that I know flosses their teeth. I think the reason why is that they're much more educated in dental health and they know, they've seen the studies, they know how important it is that 
to have good dental health, and that dental health leads to prevention of death. And and so that is that's something that please, um, please, please, please do flash your teeth. And then I think a suggestion that may be very helpful, that's very helpful to me, experience I could share with you is that I thought I was flossing my teeth correctly. And then one day, a very proactive dental hygienist said, let me watch you flush your teeth. And so I did it and she said, no, you're doing it completely wrong. And so I, I will try to post up a link to how to flush your teeth properly, but I, I actually think the best, one of the best things you can do is when you go to your dentist, have somebody watch you flush your teeth. Because, so for example, I was just pushing my the dental floss up and down, up and down. But you gotta go zigzag apparently. You have to go beneath the gum line so your the floss has to be has to hit your gum a little bit. And then my dental hygienist said you gotta do it three times on one side of the tooth and three times on the other side of the tooth. I'm sure there are there are many ways to do it correctly, but just get somebody who's professional to actually watch you. It's gonna sound very funny and silly, but so many patients that I've seen have bad dental health and it's just it is I, I think it's it's so important. I, I really think it's really important. The other thing that's really important is to make sure to take your calcium and vitamin D. I've been wanting to make a video about this for a long time, and especially if you're below 30, if you're under age of 30, take as much calcium as possible. If you're a lot of people are lactose intolerant, so don't just rely on on dairy. Eat the foods that are high in calcium. You can just do a Google search and you can figure that out very easily. Um, but also take calcium supplements if you need to and be very honest with yourself. Track the amount of calcium you take you're taking and figure out exactly how much you are taking. There are many different calculators online, you can just Google that or you just make a rough estimate. But be very frank with yourself, do you, are you actually eating that many dark green leafy vegetables? Are you, if you are not lactose intolerant, are you actually getting in the, the calcium you say you're getting from yogurt? Uh, make sure to make sure to do that, and also take your vitamin D, which now a lot of experts recommend at least 800. Uh, Brigham Women's Hospital they're doing a study doing with 2,000 with regular normal healthy people with 2,000 and trying to see if that works. I think 2,000 is definitely not an unreasonable idea, and it's totally safe. 2,000 is totally safe. 800 is safe, uh, and it's very very safe because sometimes it might sound like it's a lot, right, 2,000, but it's actually a tiny amount, uh, or it's a safe amount. I wouldn't say tiny, but it's definitely a safe amount. So the and the reason why I say this is because um, osteoporosis, people, I'm, so I'm starting to see these really sick patients, and I'm starting to see what happens when you have osteoporosis, and you get the hip fracture, and then you then you die from your hip fracture, and or you're in a ton of pain, and all of this could be prevented, uh, or a lot of it could be prevented with some simple measures. So take the calcium, take the vitamin D, and, and there are experts who recommend also making sure you get enough magnesium. So magnesium, eat your magnesium rich foods. If you have to take magnesium supplements, then, then make sure to go over that with your doctor. Everything I said, make sure to go over it with your doctor, but I, I think it's very commonsensical. I, I don't think any doctor is gonna say don't take calcium or don't, don't watch out for your magnesium. But um, calcium supplement supplement types, again, go over with your doctor. I've seen a lot of calcium citrate being prescribed and magnesium citrate. So, but, um, so these are, those are just a few things. I, there's so much more to share. I just, I just saw a recent emergent operation in the ICU. It was a very powerful learning experience because usually operations are in the OR, not in the ICU because the ICU is a, is a medical, you do, you do medical care in the ICU. And I, I learned how to put an arterial line, how to put a central venous line, so much more. I'll share that later, but I'll try to keep this as short as possible. Okay, hope you're having a good October and I'll talk to you soon. Thank you.